welcome everyone. We'll just give it a few more, maybe a minute or so for people to join us. All right. So as more participants trickle in, I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. You're at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. I'm the Associate Director for Research, Didi Kuo, and we're very excited for today's talk when we're joined by Professor Richard Thompson Ford, who's a professor of law at Stanford Law School. He writes about law, social and cultural issues, and race relations. Two previous books of his, The Race Card and Rights Gone Wrong, How Law Corrupts the Struggle for Equality, were named New York Times notable books. He has appeared on The Colbert Report, The Rachel Maddow Show, and The Dylan Radigan Show. He's a member of the American Law Institute and serves on the board of the Authors Guild Foundation. So we are honored that he is joining us today. And if you have any questions over the course of his talk, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A and we'll reserve half an hour or so for discussion at the end. So without further ado, Rich. Hi, well, thanks everyone for coming to, um, to listen to me today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I will start by talking about why I got involved in this project, because you might wonder how a law professor focused on mainly on issues of racial justice, civil rights, um, and jurisprudence decided to write a book that one might say is about fashion. Um, and there's, so there are two reasons, one's personal and one's political. The personal reason, it, it kind of has two parts. One, I like clothes. I'm a little bit of a clothes horse, I'll admit. Um, my wife complains about how many blazers I have taking up space in our closet. And, um, but that's a, a, rel a relatively mild reason. A, a larger reason had to do with the way I observed my father and his relationship to his attire and self-presentation. My father was uh, the first African-American dean at the uh, university where he taught. Um, he was also at other times in his life a community activist. Um, he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. And he went to school in the segregated South at a time when um, in historically black colleges, people would often learn a trade as well as a profession as kind of a backstop in case racial barriers kept them from pursuing their profession. He was quite successful in his profession, but he also studied to be a tailor. Um, and so he became interested in the uh, quality clothing. And we would, as a, as a kid, if, when I bought my first um, blazer, you know, he'd tug at the seams and, and look at it and say, no, this one's junk and throw it onto a pile. Um, so he was interested in clothing. But more than that, he was interested in the way appropriate attire um, helped him to navigate racial barriers. And I could see that as a child very clearly when he would go into the office. We grew up in Fresno where it's hot. And um, he'd always wear a blazer or a jacket to the office. And we'd all say, it's 100 degrees out there. Nobody wears a jacket in 100 degree weather. Why are you wearing a jacket? And he'd say, this is how a professional dresses. And I uh, began to understand as I grew older that this was important to him, not only for his own personality, but for his, um, his, his self-presentation. It was a statement um, of, self-respect. And that relationship to clothing and attire is one that he learned in part from the civil rights movement. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk. But that was something that st struck me and stuck with me. And it made me understand that attire and self-presentation can be vitally important to people, but they're not superficial in the way many people um, particularly in today's kind of relaxed environment, tend to think. Now, the professional reason is that you'd be surprised at the number of legal disputes that involve, in one way or another, dress codes. I teach employment discrimination, and there are a surprising number of cases that involve an employee suing their employer over a dress code, dress codes that require women to wear makeup or to tease their hair or to wear high heels, dress codes that um, forbid hairstyles often worn by African Americans like braids or, um, or locks, uh, dress codes that are inconsistent with the religious garb of, 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 of employees. And in these disputes, it's striking that people are fighting over 
uh, what to wear with relatively high stakes in terms of employment opportunities and in terms of employers retaining good and qualified employees. So people are willing to risk these things over dress. That's not something people do over something that's trivial. And yet the courts very typically, and I have some examples in the book, will begin the case by saying, of course, dress in and of itself is trivial. Uh, however, in this case, perhaps it rises to the level um, that would justify legal intervention because of some other thing. Uh, and I always found the way the courts dealt with these cases somewhat unsatisfying. And indeed, the outcomes in those cases often defy common sense. In one of the cases I write about in the casebook, a woman um, is refused employment because she refuses to cut her locks. This is an African-American woman. Um, the job was to work in a telephone call center where no one would ever see her. And yet the law provided no protection in that case. Um, so the balance, the common sense approach to dealing with these questions kind of goes out the window. And I was hoping that by looking more closely at the history of regulations and norms and rules around dress, I could perhaps get a better sense of why people care about it, when they care about it, what's at stake, and maybe even a way that we could do better in the contemporary environment. So I start the discussion very early. I started looking and it got, got pushed further and further back into history. So I was hoping to write a book about the late 20th century, turned into a book about the whole 20th century. And then eh, maybe I need to look a little bit at the 19th century. I wound up being able to stop in the 14th century. Um, and in the 14th century, I um, looked at, a series of laws. This was a time in European history where you began to have a lot of laws regulating attire. Um, in Tudor England, there were a series of what were called acts of apparel or acts prohibiting cost or acts against costly apparel. Um, but in other parts of Europe as well, the number of laws, what uh, historians refer to as sumptuary laws because they prohibited sumptuous attire, um, multiplied throughout Western Europe um, from the period from the, uh, sometime in the mid 1300s through about 1600. You got more and more of these laws. Um, one example I give in the book involves a hapless individual who wore a pair of trunk hose, and that's this kind of clothing, these, these puffy pants that you associate with maybe Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, it turns out that they could be more or less dramatic. And this particular individual wore a pair that was considered to be contrary to good order. And as a consequence of his wearing an outrageous and monstrous pair of trunk hose, he was arrested, dragged before the Lord Mayor of the City of London, um, where his the linings were cut out of his trunk hose. So these could be lined and you could puff them up um, and ripped out. And then he was marched through the streets as a public example to his place of residence where his other clothing that violated the law was likewise seized and cut on site. Um, so this was the kind of punishment that attended dressing in a way that violated the law. Now, what was this law designed to accomplish? Well, there were a few official rationales that had to do with waste or foreign expenditures, but it became pretty clear in looking at these laws that the most consistent motivation involved ensuring that clothing was a marker of social status. The people of high social status could wear elaborate and sumptuous clothing and people of low social status couldn't. And what was going on at this period of time was that the economy was booming and people who were not members of the aristocratic class started to have a lot of money. Um, merchants and skilled tradespeople. There were um, members of the nobility complaining about butchers' wives wearing crowns and tiaras. Um, and this concern with uh, a kind of upward sartorial uh, mobility motivated many of these laws. And in some cases, they were quite explicit about saying that people were dressing in such a way as to confuse uh, the public perception of, uh, of individuals based on their titles, nobilities, and degrees, and therefore we need to pass a law. Now, this may seem odd to the modern um, mindset, but one thing to notice is that at this period of time, um, 
fashion is has developed in a new way. Uh, tailoring, uh, the, the techniques of tailoring have become much more sophisticated, and that started in about the 1300s. That's part of why these laws started to develop in the 1300s. So you're getting a lot more expressive tailoring. Prior to this, elites tended to wear draped clothing, robes, for instance, or gowns um, that didn't allow for much differentiation, except on the basis of fabric. But after that, you started to get these very elaborate fashions. Um, and this is what some historians describe as the birth of fashion. Queen Elizabeth I was a master of using the power of fashion in order to reinforce her political power. And so fashion became a mode of statecraft, much like portraiture, much like pageantry. These were societies um, where much was communicated through visual means, through spectacle. And Elizabeth in particular uh, was quite adept and quite jealous of, the, uh, of the, her, her ability to use fashion um, in order to promote an image of magnificence. And so it was important to ensure that people of lower social status didn't kind of ape the fashions that were designed to co uh, communicate um, nobility and, and political power. Uh, and that's how you got these, uh, the, this first wave of dress codes. The, the, the next dramatic change that I describe in the book happened sometimes in the 1700s. Um, and so for all of this period of time, men and women alike, and men indeed more than women, expressed their social status through sumptuous attire, um, jewels, brocades, uh, all, uh, precious metals, uh, and very elaborate fashions. Um, a, a surprising fact about the development of fashion during this entire period of time is that it was always men who were fashion forward and women followed. The newest and latest fashions, the most cutting edge innovations went to men first. Um, fashion was a mode of social status and in um, patriarchal societies it was men who got the sexiest fashions. Um, this continued until sometime in the 1700s when men, for a variety of reasons I can talk about more in Q&A, started to reject the um, opulence of the past in favor of more streamlined uh, styles. So here's um, in the early 1700s, you know, a typical elite male, and you can see how sumptuous his attire is. And, um, but as enlightenment ideals begin to take hold, as people begin to reject, reject certain aristocratic values, um, like uh, in favor of um, values like industriousness, um, and to some extent, to a limited extent, values like equality, you begin to get different types of masculine fashion. So look how much more streamlined this is a mere 50 years later. Um, this is typical elite masculine attire 50 years later, and it gets more streamlined after that. Um, so this great, what, what some historians describe as the great masculine renunciation is a sea change in the way elite status is communicated. Whereas before it was communicated through this elaborate um, sumptuous fashion, now it becomes communicated through streamlined, seemingly sober, unassuming fashion. Although, all of the signs of elite status still exist. They just exist in much more subtle details like cut and fit, which become the hallmark of the well-dressed gentleman. But a huge division that, um, that emerges at this period of time is between being well-dressed, uh, which is associated with those, um, those, those civic virtues like industriousness and civic responsibility, and on the other hand, being fashionable, which is associated with uh, vanity, with frivolousness, and with women. Uh, so a split between well-dressed and fashionable attire that's very much a gendered split occurs. That's why it's the great masculine renunciation, not just the great renunciation. Um, in a sense, women and women's styles retain the old and discredited values of old aristocratic regimes, regimes based on vanity, on pride in the body, on, on display. Um, and women exhibit these values while men begin to exhibit this, these more, um, what you might, just, might, might understand as enlightenment values. Um, women struggle in many cases against their attire for the uh, several uh, hundred years after that. 
Um, there are attempts to reform women's dress, for instance, in the mid 1800s. Um, many of you may be familiar with Amelia Bloomer, an American feminist who tried to um, reform women's dress and created a kind of women's pants that are no were known as bloomers. It was a fashion trend that lasted for about a half a year and then it was ridiculed out of existence. Uh, the people who were successful at reforming women's fashion were the flappers, people who we might associate with frivolity, um, the Daisy Buchanan and the great uh, Gadsby, uh, you know, speakeasy cocktails and jazz. But in fact, the flappers were working women in many cases. They were an ethnically diverse group of women and they were women who were beginning to insist on civic um, privileges that were closer to those of men and to insist on clothing that reflected that. And so the streamlined flapper styles that we might think of as um, frivolous were in fact part of a political revolution. And it was very well understood at the time and very well documented at the time. And there were lots of laws and rules passed against flapper fashions at the time. Lots of dress codes that tried to ban or outlaw flapper fashions. Uh, but the flappers actually eventually won that battle and it became um, wide, 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 a widespread fashion. Um, here's an example of just how striking the prohibitions against streamlined women's wear were. Um, in the early 20th century, a woman wearing pants would be subject to arrest in many cities in Europe and the United States. And a woman in trousers was considered to be a sexual fetish. These are just regular old men's trousers, as you can see. They're not sheer, they're not see-through, they're not tight. Um, but this was a sexual fetish. A woman wearing trousers was, was called a bifurcated woman. Um, and you've got a whole magazine here kind of selling that as a sex fetish. The power of attire in political struggles, I mentioned earlier the, the, the example of the civil rights movement. I'd like to talk a little more about that. When you look at images of uh, civil rights activists in the 1950s and 1960s, people desegregating lunch counters um, and people marching for voting rights and um, civil rights, what's striking is how well dressed they are. Uh, they're wearing suits and ties, their Sunday best. And this mode of Sunday best activism was a very deliberate political strategy. In fact, one could say that the civil rights movement at that period of time had what amounted to a dress code. Uh, it's tempting from today's vantage point to kind of dismiss this in terms that some people would, would call the politics of respectability, which suggests that they were trying to ingratiate themselves with um, bourgeois white people. But that's not what was going on here at all. In fact, this was a bold statement and a demand for dignity. And that's something I learned from my father. But in researching the book, I found out just how far back this relationship between um, black liberation and fashion goes. In the, uh, in the 1700s, there were laws that actually prohibited this kind of attire for black people or the equivalent of this kind of attire in the 1700s, the Negro Act in South Carolina um, decreed that Negroes and slaves uh, were forbidden to dress above their condition and had a whole list of attire that they were not entitled to wear and, uh, and types of attire that they were to be relegated to. Uh, so the well-dressed African-American was understood at this period of time to be a threat to white supremacy. In a sense, wearing clothing that was associated with high status um, and civic virtue was seen as a demand for that status and um, as an insistence on being treated with dignity. And that was a threat to white supremacy. And this continued even after emancipation, white racist mobs would attack black people wearing their Sunday best on any day other than Sunday. Um, black servicemen coming back from the war were attacked by racist mobs for wearing their dress uniforms. Uh, and this, this, so, so this um, relationship between fashion and social status and racial hierarchy was quite well developed. And so an African-American wearing this type of attire in the Jim Crow South, no one thought that he was trying to ingratiate himself to the white power structure, just the opposite. This was a demand for dignity. Um, and it's important to understand that. Now, later generations, um, of civil rights activists 
to, took on, uh, tried different approaches to fashion. And so later you see um, groups like SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that um, wore overalls or um, workwear in solidarity with the people they were trying to uh, organize. But when you look at those photos, once again, this wasn't accidental. It was a type, type of dress code. It was a dress code that was adopted in opposition to Sunday best activism to some extent. But nevertheless, it was a quite deliberate use of fashion in order to advance a social movement. And then later, of course, um, groups like the Black Panthers who developed a new Afrocentric fashion sense and aesthetic um, that was suitable to their political goals. Once again, not an accident, but a very well considered and deliberate strategy, a type of dress code designed in order to advance a political agenda. Um, let's fast forward to the present moment and ask whether or not any of this is still relevant, because I imagine that many people in today's environment, and particularly here in the Silicon Valley, where CEOs wear t-shirts and hoodies, might say, well, we've we, we moved beyond this now. But let me give you a couple examples that will suggest that that may not be the case. Um, Mark Zuckerberg wears a gray t-shirt very famously, um, except when he's in front of Congress, then he puts on a suit. But the gray t-shirt became a signature. And at one point he said uh, something like this. Well, I wear a gray t-shirt every day because I don't want to waste any time with trivial things like what to wear. If I wasted my energy on trivial matters like that, I wouldn't be doing my job to make Facebook the best company it can be. Now, I would submit to you that that's not someone who doesn't care about what people wear. Quite the opposite, someone who's ascribed moral significance to what people wear. It's a new type of dress code. And there's a little bit more evidence for that um, because somebody who cares about what they wear or looks like that isn't doing their job. They're wasting their time. Um, now, there's a little bit more evidence for that when Marissa Mayer, who was the, um, the C CEO of Yahoo, was photographed wearing a fashionable dress, what did people say in the Silicon Valley? They said, she looks like she's going off to a party or on vacation while everybody else is working. So I'm not sure that we've moved away from dress codes rather than uh, establishing different types of dress codes. It's one last example. Um, the investment bank Goldman Sachs a few years ago got rid of their formal dress code. They used to require uh, you know, jackets and ties and typical business wear. Um, so this, but they, they sent out a memo saying we're getting rid of the dress code in part because a lot of our clients are in the Silicon Valley and um, it doesn't fit with the Silicon Valley ethos. You know, in fact, um, famously, one entrepreneur said never invest in a tech company where the CEO wears a suit. Um, there's another kind of dress code. But, at any rate, so Goldman Sachs gets rid of the dress codes. Um, but the memo says, we all know what is and is not appropriate to wear in the workplace. Hmm. Do we? Well, the response to that and throughout the financial sector had been to move from the dress code of suit and ties to a new de facto dress code. It consists of a button down Oxford collar shirt, a Patagonia fleece, a pair of khakis. Um, it's the Midtown Uniform, and if you don't believe me, you can look on the Instagram page called Midtown Uniform, and you will see hundreds of men in the financial sector wearing almost exactly the same thing. Just no dress code, but we all know what is and is not appropriate, and everyone's gravitated toward this. All the men have. Um, for women, it's not quite so easy. And indeed, some people have suggested that the demise of formal dress codes puts women in a tight spot. It makes it harder, in a sense, for them to dress appropriately than under the old dress codes. Um, so my ultimate suggestion here is simply that we haven't really gotten away from dress codes. They've taken different forms. Um, and in some sense, the new ethos of casual wear can be a more insidious and in some ways more in egalitarian form of dress code even than the old ones. I think we could do better, uh, but in order to do better, we have to begin by taking attire and self-presentation seriously. And that's been the thing that ever since the great masculine renunciation, 
serious minded people have refused to do. Uh, my hope is that I, my book will make some small contribution in remedying that. Thanks for listening. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for that really fascinating discussion and also book. Um, so anyone who has questions, go ahead and type them into the q and see some trickling in. But I was just going to kick us off by asking, in terms of the law, um, obviously we have uh, First Amendment here that protects speech and expression and clothing is maybe a way to express yourself. And yet you've said that many employers have the right to dictate how employees dress. Um, so where are you allowed in America today um, or what institutions and organizations are allowed to control what people wear, whether it's schools or maybe airlines, you know, different kinds of uniforms in the public sector, um, and who is not, like who is and is not allowed to create an actual codified dress code? Well, in one sense, most institutions are allowed to create some kind of dress code. Employers have very broad prerogatives. That's the easiest case. In the United States, we have what uh, the default regime is employment at will, and that means the employer can set terms and the employee is free to either accept those terms or reject them, meaning find another job. Um, the restrictions involve discrimination. So, um, you know, if the dress code is discriminatory, then it's unlawful. Other than that, the employer can have pretty much whatever dress code they like. And then to get into the question of what counts as discriminatory, this gets quite complicated. You might think that's a simple question, um, but just to give you an example, um, it's not considered to be sex discrimination for an employer to have one dress code for men and another dress code for women. Uh, go figure. Uh, on the other hand, it may be considered discriminatory for an employer to have the same dress code for everyone regardless of religion if the dress code prohibits um, garb that's religious. So there, I, I, I can't, you know, that's just to give you a sense of how the legal complexity is involved with this. Other institutions, public schools can and do have dress codes. They can be quite severe. Um, uh, cities have dress codes to the extent that there are public decency laws and American cities have in fact outlawed a variety of types of attire as violating law, um, public decency laws. For instance, sagging pants, you know, often favored by African-American young men. A lot of cities in the United States outlawed those as a violation of public decency. The ACLU is pushed back, but many of those laws are still on the books and it's not at all clear that that's beyond the authority of um, of government. So there are dress codes everywhere. Okay, that's surprising. Um, so a question from your colleague at the law school, Eric Jensen, mm -hmm. notes that this talk is super interesting. And would you comment on fashion in the crosshairs of religious identity versus national identity, like the hijab in France and efforts to outlaw? I mean, you just mentioned there's this example yes. of just outlawing all religious garb across the board, but um, especially in the formation of national identity and, and allowing certain types of religious expression. Yes, well, in um, so the, the law in France is different than in the law in the United States. Their approach to religious liberty and the establishment of religion is somewhat different than in the US. So in France, um, the legal principle of laicite uh, means that the state uh, should be not just neutral, but a place free of religious influence. And that's a little different than the, what we do in the United States. So um, the rules against the headscarf in France are understood to reinforce and defend the principle of laicite by ensuring that the public schools are free of religious influence. That's the, that's the rationale there. Um, now, obviously these are very controversial. And they're, they're controversial within France, they're certainly controversial outside it, but many European nations have taken the position that um, conspicuous religious symbols are inconsistent with national um, secular norms. Now that's, that's, that's certain public institutions, it's not the same though someone walking down the street. Um, in France. So the, for instance, the headscarf ban in France around public schools, it's a very specific environment. It's understood to be public officials, public institutions with a particular public mission, but it is very different than the um, American approach to accommodation of religion um, or free exercise. 
Um, there's a question about our profession. Um, David Larkin is asking, how prevalent is sartorial discrimination among academics? Uh, for example, someone who's tenure track versus yeah. not tenure track. So how is status conveyed within something, you know, within different professional contexts? Yes, it's a great question. I, you know, I, it's hard to measure because it's almost never done explicitly, but yeah. one can certainly see that in the academy, there is a mode of dress that's expected and that people who depart from it might be um, perceived as less serious. I think this is especially a problem for women. One of the things I write about in the book is the women are constantly forced to tread this kind of catch-22 where there's a norm that they should be decorative, but it also a norm that they should be modest. Um, they're constantly at risk of either seeming too sexy, too seductive, too frivolous, but also too frumpy um, and therefore indifferent to um, you know, social opinion, and all of those are bad things. And so in the academy, the, um, you know, what I see is a lot of evidence that women are, who are seen as either too fashionable, too vain, too sexy, are going to be punished subtly for that and not taken as seriously. I have examples in the book of uh, women who were advised by senior colleagues, you know, that dress, you really shouldn't wear that if you want to be taken seriously. Um, and you know, certainly in the legal profession, there are all sorts of examples of what not to wear seminars, um, usually with most of the advice directed at women again, saying, you know, you need to be careful about what you wear if you want to be taken seriously as, a, as an attorney. Um, so I do think that that exists. Here, one last example along those lines, there was a, um, a, 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 an empirical study about, um, dress and its effect on the way students perceived professors. Um, and interestingly enough, what they found was that under the right circumstances, the pr more dressed down the professor was, the higher status the students thought the professor was. They call it the red sneakers effect. But the professor that wore something quirky or, or you know, dressed down, the students kind of perceived them as higher status. Now, this was only men, once again, but um, one observation that many people make is that if you go to an academic conference, you can tell who the Ivy League professors are because they're the worst dressed people in the room. Um, why? They don't need to dress well. So there's a way in which dressing down is a way of signaling, you know, I don't need to care what other people think. Um, I've already made it. The people who are tenure track, um, you know, the women, the people of color, the people whose status is in some doubt, they feel the need to dress up. And I do think that that's a very pervasive phenomenon in the academy. Um, so a question from Dinsha Mystery at CDDRL is about targeting and selective enforcement. If public dress laws can be used to selectively punish or harass certain people, yeah. um, are there are ways are there ways to prevent selective enforcement um, and or any kind of litigation that has been able to show that it's selective? Uh, well, there's certainly been litigation. Now, um, the, proving it is hard uh, with respect to selective enforcement. So some of the litigation has has um, attempted to attack things like public decency laws or various types of dress codes as simply um, it's violating something like freedom of expression. That's been one of the tactics that the ACLU has used, for instance, is just to say the state it, it doesn't have the authority to tell people what to wear. Um, you know, that is a sensible legal strategy, but it's not perfect because public decency laws have long been considered to be lawful. And so, you know, then you're in a question of asking, well, does this one go too far? Um, you know, the problems of selective enforcement, it's exactly the same kind of issue you get with things like stop and frisk. Um, you, it's a hard thing to prove statistically. If you, you know, if you can do so, you may have a legal claim um, on equal protection grounds, but um, that's not easy. Right. Um, so is there a is there usually a set of professions or people in a society that are allowed to not conform or sort of be unconventional in how they dress? Um, it seems like a lot of your the talk at least focused on the changing economy, industrialization, who's in and out of the workforce, whose work is considered legitimate, and then what kind of dress is associated with that. And you typically probably have a lot of people who are trying to conform or be conventional in order to signify their status. Um, but are there like artists or creatives 
who typically push the boundaries of what's acceptable. And I'm thinking a little bit of like the hippies after, yeah. you know, in the seventies, um, people who have then led to sort of a cultural change in how we think about conventionality. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, and you know, I mean, wow, I could say a lot about this. It's a very interesting question. Um, the, the, so I'll give a few examples. Um, you know, most of the historical periods that I described from even from the very early, uh, you know, see the early Renaissance, um, there were a group of kind of edgy women who adopted aspects of male attire. And they did so, um, you know, sometimes they may have been what we consider today to be cross-dressers, but for the most part, they were women who um, wanted to assert male privilege of one time, type or another. That's part of why women wearing masculine clothing was seen as a sexual fetish very early on, because it suggested sexual license of the type that usually men reserved for themselves, but also just the social privileges of men. So there, you know, there, there are some early examples. Uh, when you look at the flappers were another instance of people who were successful in women's dress reform in a way that earlier reformers like the bloomers weren't, in part because they were doing it as fashion um, rather than as a political statement. And so it was edgy. It was, you know, in today's parlance, cool. And um, therefore it captivated a large part of the population who wouldn't have perhaps, you know, signed onto a political agenda. Uh, uh, similarly, um, I write about the zoot suits in the 1940s. Now, this was a, an adaptation of the traditional business suit, you know, the ultimate symbol of bourgeois conformity. But of course, the zoot suit turns it distorts and it turns it into this, this flamboyant you know, thing with baggy pants and long, um, long uh, uh, coats. And it's a symbol of jazz and of freedom and of, you know, kind of a countercultural revolt. Now, once again, not an explicit political agenda, but astute observers at the time like Octavio Paz um, or Ralph Ellison noted that there was real social and political significance behind the zoot suit. You know, they were pushing the boundaries. And then you get into, um, you know, the 1950s, as you say, the hippies, the peacock revolution. A lot of what I'm describing, or I described in terms of the um, relationship between Sunday best activism and then the later activist of SNCC and the Black Panthers was very similar to the relationship between the hippies and their parents. Um, you know, it was a bohemian, it was avant-garde, it was a new um, and, and what was understood to be more authentic relationship to attire, counter-cultural, counter-conformity. Um, and I think that was going on within the Black liberation movement as well as outside it um, with the hippies, beatniks, um, the peacock revolution for men and all of that. So yes, there's certainly people who can and have done that and artists are a great example. Okay, great. So we're getting some more questions that are more political. Um, okay. To start with Steve Stedman here at CDDRL, who notes that you are looking very sharp also. Um, he remembers at the time of Charlottesville, the white supremacist rallies that a lot of the racist right were dressed in khakis and polo shirts. Yeah. So is, is there a dress code of the racist right? It's his first question. This is a multi-parter. Um, another question has to do with Zoom and webinars. Yeah. Do you think there's going to be like an ongoing casualization of the workplace or are we actually going to return to different kinds of dress codes once we're all back face to face? And finally, some fashion, especially maybe in the 90s, was wealthier classes embracing or co-opting what might be poorer fashion, like slashed jeans or, you know, mm -hmm. cutoffs or something. Um, so what what does that mean? When has that been a trend? And you can take each of those questions in turn. OK, great. Um... Let's see. So, oh, the, the white supremacist. Um, you, you, yes, you do sometimes see this, this phenomenon of a group asserting its identity through some kind of a dress code. And that, you know, unfortunately includes groups like white supremacists. This, this khaki and polo shirt look was something that was fairly well documented in the press as a deliberate right. strategy. And, um, you know, to me, it had some resonance with Hitler youth, frankly, um, when you look at some of the old photos of the, you know, youth organized under the Nazis, they looked an awful lot like that group of white supremacists right down to the haircuts. Um, so there's a sense in which the, and this gets to, to a, a way in which the power of fashion as a communicative thing 
is in part that you can say things through fashion that you can't say in words. Um, you can communicate messages that you'd be afraid to communicate in words and, um, and evoke uh, associations that you might want to deny or repudiate. Um, and so I expect that's some of what's going on there. Um, um, oh, the second question was Zoom. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I mean, of course, the trend toward the casual was well underway um, before Zoom, but Zoom has in many ways accelerated it. And I think in part because one of the imperatives in today's environment about fashion is that people look authentic, not contrived. And, you know, while wearing a suit and tie when you're walking down Wall Street might seem, you know, sensible, natural, um, wearing it while you're in your living room with the kids running around in the background on Zoom seems a little contrived. And so people want <laughs> something that looks like, you know, that, that looks authentic, but at the same time, they still want to look professional. And that's the tricky part. So I think you're starting to get a whole lot of kind of um, high status athleisure, uh, you know, sweaters and sweatshirts, but that look a little more refined. So you, you don't want the sweatshirt that your kid's wearing in the Fortnite tournament, um, but you still want, you know, a sweatshirt. I, I think that trend will continue um, when we get off soon. I actually kind of expect that we'll also see some movement back to some degree of formality, at least maybe when people are away from work, because I think people are tired of being stuck inside and they want, um, they want the, you know, the kind of display and the relationship to physicality in the body that Zoom denies us. And that includes fashion. I mean, I think that's why people have been so interested in TV shows that are um, highly fashion oriented, like The Queen's Gambit and Bridgerton and, and you know, things like that. that. There's this longing for that relationship to fashion and other people in the body. Um, oh, shoot. What was the last one? About um, when the wealthy embrace like oh, you know, slash jeans, down, yeah. like, down fashion, yeah. Right, right, yeah. That's a long, long standing trend as well. Um, Henry the Eighth dressed as um, Robin Hood at one point. It's well documented um, as part of a, uh, a as part of a, a prank on his wife. And so Henry the Eighth and his which one? Um, yeah, that's yeah. You can't <laughs> remember. There were seven of them. <laughs> Um, right. But I think it was Anne Boleyn, but I'm not certain. Uh, don't quote me. But um, so that trend and the trend of you know the wealthy dressing you know down um, in part became a sexual fetish. It also became a way of taking license. Um, so in the book of the courtier, uh, Baldassare Castiglione writes about the masquerade and the way that the masquerade and dressing in um, in, in costume provided license. And he says, even though ye be recognized by all, nevertheless, this different attire provides a certain license. And so I think that that, you know, is, is underlying some of what's happening when wealthy people are dressing down. I also think, you know, there's a longstanding um, sense of kind of romanticizing um, the either working class or you know, poor people, and that that's involved in some of this. Uh, the fashion of the you know the last thing to say is that the fashion of the streets is great. You know, it's fascinating just as a matter of um, design and as a matter of something interesting. So it's natural that a lot of people would want to copy it. But this kind of cross class um, relationship goes both ways. There's also the way in which people of lower classes dress like um, wealthier people, but not in order to imitate them or in order to pass themselves off. That's less interesting. But what's more interesting is when they do it in order to sort of transform what the wealthy uh, uh, status symbol means. Um, so I write in the book, for instance, about a group of you know, African-American hip hop artists that called themselves the low lives, but low stood for polo. Um, and they wear all this polo gear. Or if you'll, you know, remember like Kanye West raps about um, pink polos. Um, so the, the, the relationship between hip hop and Ralph Lauren um, in particular is quite strong, but they're not trying to pass themselves off as prep school students. They've got to, they, they've turned it into something different. Um, so those kind of relationships are quite well established in the history of, of, of fashion. Okay, um, so we have a question from Brett Carter, a visiting scholar here, about if there's any data about which governments require politically marginalized ethnic minorities in particular to maybe dress in a way that distinguishes them from the majority. Um, some governments may require dress homogeneity across in-groups and out-groups like ethnic Uyghurs or something in China. 
but other governments require out groups to dress distinctively like the star of David in Nazi yes. Germany. Um, so do you have a sense of when, um, when countries have done this and how they vary and in which group has to perform sort of the signifier? Well, I certainly have examples. I don't know if I have a general theory, but okay. so, so for instance, in the in the book, I write about um, in Renaissance Italy, in Northern Italy, um, the well, really throughout the Italian peninsula, cities um, required Jewish people to wear distinctive clothing. Sometimes it was um, a yellow or a red badge of some kind. At one point, um, it, for Jewish women in Northern Italy, it was earrings. Um, so interestingly enough, the earring was not typically worn by Northern Italian women at this period of time, um, but it was often worn by Southern Italian women, um, including Jews. And the Jewish women who migrated from the South to the North, in part escaping anti-Semitism, brought the jewelry with them it, for a while wore earrings, eventually took them off in order to blend in. And you know, just it wasn't part of the fashion. The law required them to put the earrings back in as a marker of their religious faith. And it also clearly had a symbol of, um, decadence and um, and vice. And so sure. it was a loaded symbol to make them do this. But there's one example. Um, you know, I also write about on the other side, the um, in, in Scotland in uh, 1745 or after 1745, the Tartan Act which uh, outlawed the wearing of clan tartans and, um, and kilts and various other things in an attempt to try to stamp out a distinctive Scottish national identity. This was just after the failed um, revolutionary attempt and um, the consolidation of um, British power. Um, so bringing part of bringing Scotland into Great Britain quite forcefully involved um, outlawing their distinctive garb. Now, as we know, of course, it didn't quite work. In fact, in many ways, it reinforced the desire of Scottish people to wear the, the tartan and the kilt. And there's a fascinating history there about how that um, eventually developed. And it really reinforced the idea of clan tartans where it hadn't, in, in ways that hadn't even been there before um, the, the 1745. Interesting. Um, so I am going to allow Frank Fukuyama, our director, to ask the question now, Frank. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, Richard, uh, I missed the opening part uh, of your talk because I have to uh, teach a class uh, that overlapped, uh, but I have heard you speak before, yes. uh, and it's a fascinating topic. Uh, I had a question about a certain kind of dress. Uh, I thought about this like in connection with, uh, you know, wearing a Patek Philippe watch because <laughs> yes. uh, if you... Uh, you know, if you look at a Patek Philippe and you're not into expensive Swiss watches, you think it's a Timex, right? It, it really does not look at all distinctive. And when you wear one, you're really sending a signal to an extremely narrow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, social class that, you know, is also likely to be in the market for Patek Philippe watches. And I, I take it that Nike has these special edition sneakers that they put out that go on auction for you know tens of thousands of dollars, and once again, the only people for whom this is going to be a status symbol are, you know, this extremely narrow class of people. And I wonder what you make of that kind of uh, that kind of signaling. Yes. So this is part of the trend that I'd argue started with the great masculine renunciation. So the things that are very obvious as status symbols, you know, jewels, precious metals, um, all that, men get rid of that. And they go for these streamlined you know, clothing, which is, you know, to a distant observer, it doesn't distinguish people on the basis of social class. Um, it could be like the Timex as opposed to the Petek Philippe. And, um, the, you know, but to those in the know, there are a thousand tiny details, fit, cut, fabric, um, you know, it, uh, are you wearing the right kind of fabric at the right time? So savoir faire becomes the way that status is now communicated rather than something that's obvious to everyone, in part because it makes it really hard to copy. And I think that the kind of the, 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 the symbolism around the Patek Philippe is kind of like that. If you're a watch guy and you're in the know, you know, that's a Nautilus. Not only does it cost $30,000 in the boutique, you can't get one in the boutique. Um, there's a waiting list that's 10 years long. And that's, a, you know, that's a status symbol of a very particular type. And there are a lot of them. 
in today's environment. I think you see it, um, you know, at a more subtle level. Mark Zuckerberg's T-shirts apparently are made by Brunello Cuccinelli, um, and if you Brunello Cuccinelli doesn't sell anything that costs less than two hundred dollars, so you know that's not just a great T-shirt. Uh, but how many people are going to notice this? And that kind of signaling is very much the new form of understated status. Right. Um, so we have a few more questions, so I'll try to get through them in turn. Um, one question from Aaron Carter, from uh, who's a visiting scholar here, is if flappers and um, civil rights activists used fashion to sort of implicitly signal certain things, what do you think that um, fashion, political movements today how will they use fashion? Or do you know of any movements either in the United States or elsewhere for which clothing has been pretty important? And I mean, I know women sort of knitted certain types of hats for yes, after yes. Trump was initially elected, but anyway. Right, yeah, but see, that's a great example. So it's really interesting that, um, that, that um, sometimes political movements in the contemporary environment don't use fashion. So, you know, Black Lives Matter um, it, last summer, you, at first you had just this outpouring and it was very symbolically powerful in a sense precisely because it seemed to represent everybody without respect to, you know, um, um, you know race or social class, so this huge outpouring of, of concern and anger about police violence. But then slowly you got dress codes. So you got a group in South Carolina that said, come in your Sunday best, kind of, kind of an homage to the civil rights movement of the 1950s. You got um, trans people in, in um, I think it was Brooklyn or maybe in Queens, um, wearing all white, suffragette white. Um, you know, you have the pussy hats that you talked about with the, after Trump was elected. You have um, the yellow vests in, right. in Paris and in, in France, um, all of these ways. And I think sometimes what's happening is in order to demonstrate that you've got an organized group, uh, dressing a dress code is a really useful way to do it. Um, one savvy commentator noted that in today's environment where political movement to marches and demonstrations are organized on social media, you can organize a big group of people like that. Um, and that's great for the social movement in one sense. But on the other hand, it kind of dilutes a particular kind of message that you want to send, which is we've got organization, we've got commitment, and what have you. When you organize the March on Washington, there's no social media and everyone understood you, you know, if they could pull this off, they've had years of organization. They've got local groups everywhere organized. They've got people who are committed on the ground. They're a force to be reckoned with. That's not as true today when you organize a similar march on Facebook, but one way you can show a little more organization and cohesion is with a uh, uh, common um, dress. Okay, so we have a question about the military um, and which has rigorous dress codes um, and enforcement of them. So what, uh, what role do dress codes in the military play and the military is such a central organization, sort of the face of a country's yeah. security and its, its power? Yes, well, I mean, of course the military has, um, you know, uniforms and um, their uniforms are very heavily regimented and regulated. Now, um, it, it's interesting that I, at one point I said, you know, there was a time when military uniforms were um, bespoke. Someone in, in England, they'd go to a tailor, a Savile Row type tailor, and the, the, uh, the officers at least, and they'd have their uniforms made to uh, custom specifications. Um, and I made the mistake of saying, you know, well, of course we don't do that in the United States. And a military officer, you know, emailed me and said, by the way, you're wrong about that. Um, we get our uniforms customized all the time. There's a whole subculture of military officers who go to tailors all over the world, wherever they're stationed, and get all kinds of custom details sewn in. Um, sometimes sure. we they they push the boundaries of the regulations, and other times people just don't notice. But um, you know, anybody in the military knows this. So I, that was news to me. But there is this you know you, you want to present a common front, and yet people still want individuality and they still want to look good and they still want flourishes. So even in something like a military uniform, there's a little bit of self-expression going on. Okay, so I'm going to group two final questions for you. One is um, if you can describe what the sort of standard is for women, professional women today. I mean, more and more women yeah. have been graduating from college, entering professions. Yes. We obviously know there's still a lot of work to be done, but um, 
you know, what does count as sort of expected or normal for women? And the second question is, you know, if we're not using clothing to indicate status, aren't there other ways? What are some other things that that we can or that people typically use besides yeah. dress codes to also indicate that? Right. Well, I mean, as, as far as the question about professional women goes, this is a constantly contested terrain. And for part of the, the reasons that I mentioned, um, women's historically, you know, until very recently, women's attire um, was the symbolic opposite of masculine attire. I mean, this started in the 1700s with the great masculine renunciation. Um, but that symbolic opposition uh, was quite explicit as a, um, you know, explicitly connected to the fact that women were excluded from the professions. And so in all, a whole variety of ways, professional attire was masculine attire and vice versa. Right. And feminine attire was the symbolic opposite. That makes it harder for women. And as women are moving into the workplace um, in much larger numbers now, they're still confronted with that catch 22 that I described. Now, um, some women have said the, you know, the, the, the pantsuit, um, or the skirt suit was a you know pretty good compromise for professional women. It was working pretty well. And now what's happened? Well, we're getting rid of the suit, um, and we're moving to you know the hyper casual. And again, it's still easier for men to adopt that uniform, what's now become the midtown uniform or the high tech thing, than it is for women. So so much depends on the field and the profession. There's certainly places where they're still places where women are expected to wear a skirt. I've heard of judges, for instance, who expect the female attorney to wear a skirt. And if she's wearing a pantsuit, that's a problem for the judge. Meanwhile, you know, you're in the Silicon Valley. And if you wear, you know, that you're going to look like, um, you know, someone who's really out of touch. So it's tricky. And I wish I had a shorter answer. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of status and status symbols, well, I think we still express status through our clothing. Um, you know, and it's along the lines of the thing that um, Professor Fukuyama was talking about in terms of uh, subtle things. You know, you, if somebody's wearing a hoodie, but they've got on a Patek Philippe watch, you, we already know something about their status. Um, but we also do it, for instance, on Zoom, there's the Zoom background. What's in the background? What kind of furniture is back there? There's a, a, a website called Room Raider where oh, right. people, you know, rate the room behind you. And, you know, it started off as kind of a lark, but, you know, a lot of people pointed out, wow, they're, they're actually really judging people according to kind of a status hierarchy, according to whether, you know, the kitchen is clean or the back, the books in the shelf behind you are weighty um, and, and, and serious books or they trashy romance novels, um, this kind of thing. So I think there are all sorts of ways that people are still kind of sizing each other up, um, right. both clothing and otherwise. All right. Well, I appreciate that this webinar has at least been a judgment-free zone. And thank you so much for joining <laughs> us you. for this really fascinating talk and discussion. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for yes, your great you. questions. And um, best of luck with the book. Thanks so much. It. Thanks, Thanks so much for inviting for me. Take care. Bye, everyone.